How Althea Gibson Overcame Racism in Tennis. This entry was posted in Uncategorized on August 28, 1950 by Althea Gibson. The first black player to compete in a USLTA-sanctioned tournament was Reginald Weir in 1946's Eastern Indoor Tournament. A black player had finally been permitted to participate against the sports elite in one of its most prestigious events, and Gibson was about to illustrate what the white tennis community in America had been missing out on for so long. Her father was a sharecropper and Gibson grew up in Harlem, New York. Gibson was a wild, haughty kid who loathed school and could defend herself with her fists. According to her 1958 autobiography, I always wanted to be somebody. Also an excellent athlete, she rapidly mastered paddle tennis, a variation on the traditional racket and ball game. Gibson started competing on the virtually exclusively Black American Tennis Association ARTA, circuit under the instruction of one-armed pro Fred Johnson at Harlem's Cosmopolitan Tennis Club. In addition to her physical prowess, the lanky kid irritated more seasoned players with her unsportsmanlike demeanor. In 1946, Gibson lost to Wilberforce, Ohio, in the Arta Finals. So the prodigy's growth was taken over by a couple of tennis-playing Southern doctors. Dr. Hubert Eaton's residence in Wilmington, North Carolina. Gibson continued high school studies and practiced on the backyard court of her new host. She spent the summer in Lynchburg, Virginia, with Dr. Robert W. Johnson. It made her a more disciplined young lady and helped her develop her court abilities. She won her first of 10 Arta Women's Championships in the summer of 1947. Gibson was invited to participate in the Eastern Indoor Tournament in Harlem in early 1949, after the door was opened for Weir. While Eaton and Johnson and the rest of the Arta team were impressed by her performance, they knew that she was just scraping the surface of her potential. It was the American Tennis Association's goal to secure Gibson's entry for the prestigious US Open when she participated in the Eastern Indoors for a second consecutive year in 1950. According to Sports Illustrated, USLTA officials were open to Gibson playing in the US Nationals if she first proved her ability against first-class players elsewhere. The issue was that no tournament outside of the Arta would allow her in. To highlight this catch-22, former American champion Alice Marble wrote a scathing editorial in the July 1st edition of American Lawn Tennis magazine. Gibson was allowed to compete in the National Clay Court Championships in Chicago and the Eastern Grass Court Tournament in New Jersey after his incisive remarks were heard. She found out she was in the U.S. Nationals field shortly after winning her fourth consecutive Arta Championship in Wilberforce. Her Nationals debut against Barbara Knapp went well, but her next match against Wimbledon winner Louise Bruff cemented her status as a serious contender. Gibson shook off her early nerves and seized a 7-6 lead in the fourth set to put the tired champ on the ropes. But a tremendous thunderstorm broke out in the skies, postponing the game till the following day. Bruff regained her calm and won three games in a row to clinch the match. Some admirers, like David Eisenberg of the New York Journal American, were not totally pleased with Gibson's performance. I've seen many exciting sporting events, but none more spectacular than Miss Gibson's match versus Miss Bruff, Eisenberg wrote. Not for superb tennis, no, but the conditions deprived this lonely, anxious, colored girl of her tremendous achievement. Gibson won 16 of her first 18 events in 1956. A historic victory at the French Championships made Gibson the first black tennis player, man or woman, to win one of the world's four major singles championships. Gibson lost in the quarterfinals against Shirley Fry before winning the doubles championship. The Sunday graphics Scotty Hall noted the unspoken, unexpressed yet anti-Gibson mood that surrounds her matches. Gibson was eager to overcome whatever difficulties remained in 1957. For the women's singles title, she defeated Darlene Hard in straight sets. 
A year after being greeted with skepticism by the London audience, the Harlem child was crowned Wimbledon Queen by Queen Elizabeth II. From there, Gibson was celebrated with a ticker tape parade in New York City, after Jesse Owens in 1936. She went on to win the US Nationals in September and end the year as the sport's first female number one. After winning Wimbledon and the US Nationals in 1959, Gibson chose to become professional to maximize her earnings at the height of her popularity. That year she released Althea Gibson's Sings and starred in The Horse Soldiers, both of which were one-offs. As a result of her ill-fated professional tour, she also obtained a lucrative deal to perform before or during Harlem Globetrotters basketball games. Gibson took up golf in the early 1960s, seeking a new challenge and a new source of income for his family. For the second time, she created history by joining the LPGA. Despite her tremendous strength and agility, she never reached the pinnacle of the sport. At the conclusion of the decade, the rules were amended to enable professionals to participate with amateurs in tournaments. But she had lost ground to the next generation of young, outstanding potential. The dearth of possibilities that followed Gibson's profession led people to notice that she became more angry as she aged. Achieving Gibson's success was difficult for others who resembled her. Arthur Ashe won the US Open in 1968, but it would be 31 years until Serena Williams won a Grand Slam. In Gibson's case, he lived long enough to witness Serena and Venus take the torch as the new black champions. Her monument currently stands across Flushing Meadows Park in Queens, overlooking the US Open's newer home, a reminder of both her excellent record against the world's best of her day, and the mountains she had to move to achieve that chance.